Rafa, and thank you also, Mar, for the opportunity to present uh, today our our work together with Gabriela. Uh, I'm gonna. I have already shared this this PowerPoint, this presentation that Gabriela and me had had prepared together. And before that, we have to say that it has been an interesting exercise because. Uh, today we have this opportunity of sharing our our research, but uh, an interesting exercise has been that it's it has been a research that Gabriela and me had done separately from the beginning, but now we have kind of tried to see what are the links, what are the connections we between the our two cases. So we hopefully think that that this might be interesting, but of course it has like this these limitations and these tensions no? of, of, of connecting something that has uh, already been done in a separate way, but then see what are the, 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 the relations among the, no? So see, as you can see in this presentation, we were gonna talk about our research uh, conducted in Buenos Aires and in Tanger. Uh, Gabriela has done many research in, for much more time than me in Argentina and Buenos Aires, and I also did a, small, I did a small research in Tanger in Morocco. So our role, our intention today is to ex uh, explain a bit how, uh, how this research has been in these two contexts, you not know, taking the the the, the differences between them, but also the connections between them. And then we're gonna draft a bit the empirical research, and then we will conclude with some emerging discussion and with some global debates, you no, know, hopefully thinking that this might be interesting for those you know, who who are interested in this network on science, religion, and health, and then who are either interested or doing uh, research on on issues related to science, religion, and health, no, and why we want to address why to why to address these connections between science, religion, and health through the case of infertility and fertility and reproductive technologies, no, and why this can be uh, a case study to reflect on this connection, which is what the network is about. Is about no? So, so yeah. So as I said, this is this will be the structure of of our presentation, and hopefully then we'll get questions and we'll have some some discussions. So I give the floor to to uh, Gabriela so that she can explain a bit about her context. Thank you, Rosa, very much for your kind presentation of 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 our objectives and aims with this um, comparative exercise that we wanted to do for um, for a long time and now we, we are reaching our, our objective so I'm very happy about this um as some facts about the political the socio-political context uh, in Argentina uh, Argentina as you may know is a South American country that has more or less for yes 46 uh, million people and an unemployment rate of six percent more or less an unemployment rate of that. I wanted to point out these two characteristics of the country because as you can see in, a, in other indicators said that it is a country where population is poor. I mean, at least 40%. The estimated for today poverty rate is more than 50%. And as you can see, it's a population that, that has people employed. So they people are workers who are also poor. And also it's a population where the level of education has uh, been increasing all over the years. So many people can access to high school and university level degrees. Um, last year, um, uh, so, so we have like 12 million people that are in, in poverty situations. Also, I wanted to know to to focus on this uh, the fertility rate of our country. Argentina had the demographic transition in the first uh, part of the 20th century, so women had fewer children than other South American countries by the 1950s. Three children per woman per woman. Sorry, it was the fertility rate, and nowadays we have um, a fertility rate under. Too. So the society is has a little bit to stop our demographic replacement, uh, you know, indicators. Um, so last year in December we have uh, national elections, and I wanted to focus on these because this election 
period may have some impact on fertility laws that we have in the country nowadays. So that's why I'm mentioning all these indicators and the fertility, the fertility law. Uh, we, uh, Argentina is a democratic country. Uh, it's a republic and the election system is direct. So since 1983, we have a continuous democracy all over the years. People uh, every two years go and vote for Congress renovation or even every four year for a uh, president. So last year we have um, a new phenomenon. It is like we have a president uh, for a new far right movement called libertarians, which have an anarcho-capitalist discourse and a very con religious conservative ideology. Um, on the one hand, we, we have this national government and on the other hand, we have the governors who, uh, who rule the provinces of the states of, of, of Argentina, who are for, from the historical political parties. Let's say it like that, very, very simple. So this uh, current political situation has an impact on every single law in the sexual and reproductive health area. So what I wanted to mention is that we have in Argentina a uh, a law that was sanctioned in, in 2016 that states that fertility treatments are covered by social security and by um, health insurances all over the nation. What, what I mean by this covered is that they are financially covered by, by the state or by insurance uh, if women or their couples need uh, have a, a diagnosis of infertility. It doesn't matter what, what type of couple or if they're married or not, even if you're a single woman or a single person that wants to have uh, um, uh, undergo under treatment, the, the law says that you can have access to this. So that's it for me. Uh, the next one, sorry. I wanted to explain this because it's a very complex country. <laughs> sorry. The next. So in terms of the religion, uh, it is well known that Argentina, as a Latin American country and as a South American country, it's a Catholic majority country. But if we see the figures from last available studies, uh, quantitative studies that are the ones led by Dr. Fortunato Malimazzi from CONICET, and, um, and I was a member of that team, we see that Catholicism in, in a decade is declining. We have 76% uh, of the population in 2008, and now we have uh, more or less 60, 63% of the population who declare themselves as Catholic. So the Catholicism is in decline, as we said. And if we look, it's very, very small, but I try to, to put the, the numbers here. If you look at 1947, more than 90% of the of the population declared themselves themselves as Catholic. So we had a fertility rate of three, yes. remember, in the 1950s. And uh, and after that, uh, a majority of population that declared themselves Catholics. Nowadays, we have the opposite situation. Catholicism is in decline. And also, um, the fertility rate is in decline. So that's it for me now. I don't know what I touched. <laughs> yeah, Rosa, if you can, you can continue. I don't know what I did. Okay. Okay. Sorry. No, I could not find the the option for. Okay. So uh, regarding Morocco, uh, it's a completely different context uh, as, as you can imagine from from Argentina but one of the things that we can highlight no and of course it's an interesting comparison with Argentina is that uh, Morocco is a Muslim country no so it's a, a, a religious country in which the the, the religion no? the branch of its Islam that it's uh, related to the to the country is the Sunni Islam and this is something that is very relevant for the cases of fertility treatments no this is mainly because, um, as you may already know, uh, among Islam, there are two different, two big branches, which is Shia and Sunni Islam. And then uh, this marks a, a differences. And I will talk about that more when I speak, uh, when, when I talk about empirical research. But one of the most um, uh, differences between this is that when we are talking about reproductive 
technologies and uh, and uh, for infertility treatments is that uh, sh uh, the Sunni Islam is very strict with the use of donated material, uh, whereas the Shia Islam is more open to this possibility. You know? So so this, for example, uh, explains that most research on on fertility treatments about Islam is is really based on Iran because, for example, it's a country in which there are more technologies that are permitted because it's it's based on Shia Islam. Whereas in Morocco, we have to take always into account that it's Sunni Islam, the one that, that kind of regulates the fertility treatment. So this will be a big uh, difference and a big issue from the very, very beginning. No? So, so as it is a Muslim country, uh, what we have is that uh, there is a Sharia law, no, a, a law based on on religious on religious uh, knowledge that it's also the basis of the legal system, no. So, so this we will see that it it it, it challenges um, like all the systems, no, and it's it, we have to take into account when we are talking also about the healthcare system, no, because it's like the religious law is always taking into account when we, we are talking about the treatments. Uh, apart from that, as you can imagine, there are also a lot of challenges in, in Morocco uh, in terms of healthcare system. And I don't want to, I, I, I cannot speak about that in, in, in D, but yeah, you can, as you can imagine, uh, the health system in Morocco also has some challenges, especially related to resource disparities and inadequate funding. Uh, so it is uh, something that it has been, uh, according to some articles, it has been improved in the last years, but being uh, like a, a uh, uh, a poor country it has been, or, or a, develop, a developing country it has been uh, a challenge in the healthcare system. Also, it has to, we also have to take into account that regarding Morocco being a, a religious country, we also have to take into account that it, that doesn't mean that there are other uh, convictions, there are other religious beliefs and even some uh, non-religious thoughts that are present in the country. I have to say that this is something that I cannot speak about that much. I just have to acknowledge that it happens, but I have not done research on that, although I would love to do that in the future. But of course, like we have to also consider that I, I uh, like in and that, that although Islam is very important as you may imagine in, in Morocco, there are also the, the possibilities of people believing, you no, know, in in healers and in sanctuaries and and other and other beliefs that are also related or maybe not so related to to Islam, and and also you no know, in in related to that we will see and I will explain more that in the, in the empirical uh, research that one the big issues in this social political context in Morocco is the prohibition of the donated material because it's related to us. So the importance in 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 Islam uh, with, of of zina of the of you know of the marriage. You no, know? so we also have to consider that like the, the 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 laws regarding marriage and also the prohibition of adultery. So so the use of donated material is considered as zina and adultery. And also the all the uh, to be worried about the nasab and the and which which means the gene genealogical origins of of um of, of no of the family and of the kids. Also I have to say that regarding fertility treatments, also because uh, Gabriela also talked about that, I the fertility uh, rate, sorry. Um I have to say that the fertility rates in Morocco regarding the last day the last uh, reports in 2021 it's two 33 uh, kids. So it's also interesting because we also have in mind no, that, of course, there are a lot like the fertility rates are very different from other, for example, Europe European countries. But but as it's very interesting that that it's being lowered in the last years also because the conceptualization of families no, and also uh, like, yeah, like the, the, the role of women in the societies are also changing. So also the fertility rate has has gone a bit low down. So regarding our, our empirical research in Buenos Aires, I, I want to acknowledge that all, all of this uh, research that we conducted is part of a major project that is called uh, well, that was called Science and Catholicism in six scientific areas. And we work with different different perspectives and mixed methods of approach. But in general, we've, we've made a quantitative surveys from the um, yeah, interpretative paradigm 
uh, of the social sciences. We also did interviews. We also uh, conducted documentary analysis, analyzing trajectories of different experts and in different scientific fields, considering the religious epistemic communities and groups. Uh, but for this uh, for this particular presentation, I wanted to to present. To, to explain a little bit that we've done um, a major national survey where we asked about opinion, opinions and attitudes towards the, the artificial, uh, how, how do you call it in English, the reproductive technologies, sorry, um, the assisted technologies for their, for reproduction. So when we, when we talk about this with general population, we see that there are some misconceptions, uh, narratives around why these um, technologies should be used, why the state should cover these treatments or not. But in general, there is agreement that the state needs to cover these treatments for, for people who, who needs, uh, who can't have children for whatever reason. And, and also that there are some concerns about what to do with the frozen embryos that are in the country. There are many frozen embryos because the law also states that the embryos cannot be donated or even um, donated nor, nor to science, nor to another couple or to another person, to another family, and also it cannot be destroyed. So there is like um, a legal space where fertility clinics have to maintain all of these embryos, but then uh, the cost for this maintenance and so on is not clearly who who, who is going to, to take this responsibility. But anyway, so the more the more the concerns that are there about uh, about fertility technologies, about reproductive technologies are regarding with the embryos and what to do with the embryos that are frozen because it's a it's a situation that the society has not yet uh, solved. So when then when we wanted to talk about these issues with women who underwent to this treatment, we interviewed particularly religious women, I mean Catholic women, that went through uh, treatments with IVF, especially or infertility treatments in general, ICSI or, or other ones. So the, the idea was to contact sp specifically people that we, we knew that were religious uh, from snowball sampling. And, um, and we conducted thematic analysis of these interviews and could identify at least four main uh, you know, topics of discussion or concerns that these women have when going through these uh, through these uh, treatments. One of them was was about the the genetic material, I mean, donation of eggs, donations of sperm. Who is going to be? I mean, about you know the the relationship, the genetic relationship with a uh, produced embryo. Uh, and these, uh, the possibility and the expectations about the epigenetic influence on also and this relationship between genes and epi, epigenetics um, was a concern. Also about family, about relationships, about, you know, uh, who is, uh, I can't have, have the word in English right now, but it's about uh, if, we, if we are biologically related to the produced embryo, it is to my son or daughter, my future son or daughter, and what are the concerns or risks about this and, mat and this material donation. Also, subrogacy came as a topic, at least as an imaginary topic, because in Argentina it's not allowed legally to conduct this kind of procedures, but it is possible if an, altru an altruistic, Subrogacy. It is when someone from your family or a friend generos, generously offers herself or himself to to carry your produced uh, embryo. In this case, if it is an, not mediated by money, generally the justice accepts this possibility. So it is a pos an imaginary possibility of many of these women who undergo to these treatments, whether or not to have someone that you can trust and that can carry your your embryo and, and become then your son. So all of these topics were present in our in our study, and here I have some some quotes of the of of the woman who who we interviewed. But anyway, the 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 things that I wanted to to 
to point out, this is one of these um, of these quotes that says, "My greatest, my greatest wish would be for my child, well, for my child to be a result of a couple, but that's not happening now. So my second wish, or well, my greatest wish, is to be a mother." So in this way, these women who are really Catholic, mainly, yeah, they practice their religion. They know that theologically speaking, this is not a technique that is allowed by their religion. Uh, and they know that they have some uh, alternatives to the technology, such as the NAPRO technology, the natural methods proposed by the Catholic Church. But they don't do that. They go to the clinics and they also go to sanctuaries. They also go to the priests. They also go to their parishes and, and, and have a, a religious life within the Catholicism. But the thing is that the greatest wish to become a mother is prevailing among the other things. So different types of families, different arrangements of families that are not very usual um, in, in traditional Catholic environments are going on using these techniques to, to, to have uh, children or family. So um, the, the other one is that all of these women uh, that we interviewed had, froze, had frozen embryos. They had still frozen embryos when we interviewed them and they didn't know what to do with them. Some of them told us that, for instance, they stopped paying the maintenance of the fridge. So that could le lead to uh, the, you know, to the, yeah, to the disappearance of the embryo or because it cannot be donated, but no one does that. One of the other things that we learned about this process is that even the embryologist, because this was a, a project that also studied the trajectory of experts, even the embryologists do not want to waste or to destroy an embryo that has been produced and frozen. So these are one of the challenges that then we are going to, to study further in future research. Okay, uh, so regarding Morocco, uh, something that I have to say is that uh, the, this empirical research that I'm going to present is based on a, on a project that I did uh, two years ago on, on fertility treatments in Morocco and in, Bar in Tanger and in Barcelona. No? So it was a, a, a exploratory story, a, a exploratory project in which I wanted to start to analyze what are the main debates about Islam and infertility treatments in, in two different contexts. No? So I have to say that this research was framed in that project in which I wanted to compare what happens in Tanger in comparison to Barcelona being Tanger, a Muslim country and a, a city you know, with, uh, in a Muslim country, uh, Muslim country uh, in contrast to Barcelona in, a, in which Muslims are... Um, are living in a minority context, no? So, so within that uh, uh, project, uh, I, I focused on on interviews to 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 um, interviews to experts. So, so I I, I interviewed mainly gynecologists and biologists, but also health professionals. So, I I did not approach as as Gabriela was explaining, no, people and women that and and, and or couples that have gone through fertility treatments. But hopefully, I I, I will. I we wish to do that in future research no but i what i want what i want to explain is 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 what i you know what i what 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 emerged from interviewing these experts and these these health professionals that 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 that, uh, that worked in tangerine especially mostly most of them in fertility clinics but not only in fertility clinics no so so there what i what i uh, found out first is that, as you may imagine, like uh, fertility clinics are mainly uh, working in the private sector, and then and then they are very discreet. No, so they although they are they know that the the reproductive technologies that I as I explained in the beginning uh, are are permitted always when when they happen uh, when they are not in, engaging donated materials. Uh, they they can uh, couples Moroccan couples can do that with with no problem, but of course it's something that it's not very uh, publicly uh, explained no so one of the 
the big that one of the first elements that emerged is that no how they 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 didn't want to talk about uh, they they know that people do not want to talk about uh, this treatment no? so he, as you can see in this in this quote uh, uh, the one of the embryologists said we can use it it's allowed okay but IVF things are not very very acceptable here in Morocco sometimes people are afraid if it's haram or halal which is like if it's prohibited or or allowed in, in religious terms. Uh, you know, and sometimes they are, they are just scared or, or afraid if it's mixed up where they are, when they are embryos or, you know, because it's, it's re really not halal at all. It's really al haram. So and even, even if people succeed the IVF treatment, they have a healthy baby and everything, they can talk about that. They, they can't socially, it's not really acceptable for a couple to say, by the way, we had an IVF treatment and that's we had our baby. Most of the time, they just don't want to share this information. Information, no? So, uh, although they know that it's religiously permitted, they don't want to talk about that uh, to the other people, especially even even to the rest of the family. No, so um, um, and and this issue of not being very publicly explained was also very related to the fact that there was not a wide knowledge about technologies permitted. No? So sometimes there's also, uh, of course, I exp I talk to experts, but also in a in in more uh, in more anecdotal way when I talk to other people and Muslims, especially when I was also doing the research in Barcelona, I also realized that that a lot of Muslim people are not really aware that they know which are the technologies that are allowed. No, so so even when I frame this research most of the people would say oh i want to know about that but i i don't know no so it's something that of course it's very related no since it's not uh, really publicly explained then there's a lot of um uh, a, a lot of ignorance about that no um in relation to that, a big uh, another in interesting element is that uh, because, uh, as I explained at the beginning, uh, in in um, uh, yeah, Morocco is a Muslim country, so we have like the religious regulations. One of the one of the material impacts of that in the fertility clinics is that the marriage certificate becomes a the main requisite to for the for the fertility treatments. No, so when couples want to go to fertility treatment uh, clinics and they want to start a fertility treatment, one of the first things that they are required to show and the, and it's also included in the reports is that is the marriage certificate. No. And and also uh, as I said as the big as one of the big um, problems or one of the big you know, difficulties of the of the reproductive technologies in Islam is the use of donors, you no, know, is that they are very worried about the mix up, you no? Know? And it also appears in the first verbatim that I that I read, you no? Know? Like they are afraid of the mix up when they say about the mix up is that they are they are afraid that even if it's by accident that the embryos and the genes are are mixed up and that they use uh, that they use uh, um, gametes that are not uh, the couple's one. No, so so here also in the fertility agreements they were they they would referring to the, to having a strict protocols. And also it was very interesting that they say that these strict protocols were possible because they had few cases. No, so it was very interesting in that quote that they say, okay, we can because it's not like Europe or USA. No, so here like they see themselves as 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 doing much less uh, reproductive technologies than, than than other countries no we don't have a lot of cases of IVF that's why we can scuttle like one for one function per day so there's a, a quality system that we can apply but we can schedule like one function per day we are good and we put names on the dishes where the embryos are and we have multi-chamber incubator and it can minimize the mix-up because we can put the name on the chamber no so here I remember that these embryologists would explain me how they would argue Organize all the, everything so that they don't. They make sure that they don't mix up, no. And and for me, and also when we were talking with Gabriela about about this um, about this research, I, for me it was also very interesting to see that whereas they were very worried about this mix up, something that I realized uh, when I discussed that with with Gabriela is that they didn't talk that much about what happens with the embryos that they don't use, no. So so this was something that 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 I I also wish to analyze in in future in future projects, but it was also very interesting to see that at least from the beginning it doesn't emerge 
as a as a as a topic no whereas as we saw in the presentation of Arge of, 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 of of Gabriela about Argentina it was one of the main issues no um uh, another important element is that is what was the role of religion during treatments no so so apart from regulating what is permitted or not religion also emerged in the interviews as one element that also could help the treatments no so i also asked them about about these and sometimes they would say no for example they they you know regarding patients no patients are reciting or are are during the transfer of the embryo no they are praying they are they are right and they are very they, they do prayers and everything no so so the role of praying also to make sure that uh that that the treatment can be successful no so sometimes they talk about that because of course like uh, there can be possibilities that the treatments are not successful so they the role of praying in order to make sure that 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 the treatment will be, will will go to good end no uh, so so and also like uh, some health professionals also would say no like some women ask them to make a prayer for me no so yes i will pray for you and i pray for my patients no um finally another interesting element that emerged in, in my in my research is is uh, is also the role of of the reproductive tourism no i wanted to see also because as i said it was a comparative research with barcelona so i also wanted to see where are uh, to what extent the, the the fact that there are religious regulations uh, could uh, make that there are there is reproduction tourism no and that people maybe from morocco can go to other countries to to have this and i have to say that some health professionals mentioned that but did, they did not want to mention this in a in a in a very deep way so it's not like something that 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 they couldn't they didn't want at least maybe also for research limitations that they want to talk about that as much but it's true that what emerged most is the other way around no and that was surprising to me so they would say like european couples going to morocco and mainly for economic reasons no so here i i saw how uh it was not the religious reason what mark this tourism to say it somehow but the economic reasons no so couples maybe that were from moroccan origin or mixed couples that would go to morocco because they say that it's cheaper in morocco than than in 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 european countries no um and it's as interesting because in the academic uh, literature uh, there are many authors that are very critical to this word of reproductive tourism no because it's it's it seems that to do a reproductive technologies is something that to tourists no it's as touristic as if something that making but you no know, making it so very banal but they, but in the other way when what, what in the in the research what happened is that they even they mentioned this tourism no to, in order to explain this 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 um travels to Morocco. No? So here, as we can see that quote, uh, one, one said, sometimes we have couples from Europe because here is cheaper for them. And sometimes they just want to do IVF treatment here. So for example, in Morocco, it's like tourism plus IVF treatment. And it's good and it's a good thing because they are not stressed about it. No, So it's really good for the couples to come like for foreign countries and have vacation plus IVF. No? So, so it was interesting to see how to link reproduction productive treatment with with having holidays it could really be good for them no so so it was uh it was interesting to see that link although there some literature also criticizes that, that link no and finally it was also interesting to see also in religious terms how uh, there was an emerge it emerged a discussion about whereas adoption or 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 fostering a, a, a kid can be an alternative for uh, for being in, infertile no of course gabriela talked about subrogacy that didn't emerge at all and but of course adoption and enforcing was as something that was more more possible but it was true that it was like again there was a discussion because it's not really they were not really sure about where whereas adoption is 
religiously permitted or not, no? Because uh, again, as I said at the beginning, in Islam, there's like this important of of nasab or of genetic of the no of, of the uh, of making sure that the family is is uh, like your kid is part of your family. So there were also discussions about it's not you cannot give the surname your surname to someone that it's not real your kid, no? So again, this the 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 this preoccupation this the, to be worried about that was was also. Uh, it was linked to the use of of donated material, you know, to adopt someone's because it's not real, it's not your real your real kid, no. So it's also it was as interesting. Yeah. So Gabriel, I don't know if you want to. Now it's. So one of the things that we discussed with Rosa that we had in common and to to see in two different locations was the well these issues to discuss together, paying attention to two completely different uh, contexts and environments where we did our research. So the importance of genetics um, versus the donated material and all of these uh, relation between biological identity, uh, narrative identity, the ways that we always study in social sciences, but in, in this case, is, it is an important issue. And also the different conceptualizations of the human embryos. How, how do these people relate to uh, the embryos they produce in the lab and that they have collected or you know, kept in, in, in freezers through many years sometimes. So what these, these are one of the two this discussion topics that we would like to, to address. And even if you want some comments or, or, or questions that you can, you know, uh, include in the chat, we can be discussing all together. Uh, Rosa, I don't know if, if we can continue. <laughs> You are muted, but we said, uh, yeah. I guess. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again. Yeah. And related to that, to what Gabriela was saying, no, we we also discuss how. Um, no, to focus on these debates, it also speaks to no the major question about science, religion, and health. No, and how our cases of our study, although are very specific, also no show how these science, religion, and health are in dialogue and negotiation. No, and how mm, religion on one hand can be a marker, no, to validate which technologies are permitted in a specific context, um, uh, but also it opens debates, no, because it's sometimes it's not so clear what religions permitted and then there's like this negotiation about you know, how strict you uh, conceptualize the religious uh, uh, perspective or not. No? And, and then of course um, it opens up the discussion about new ways of conceptualizing family and reproduction. No? So, so, uh, so I think that especially when we, uh, uh, Gabriela did research with patients and I, I didn't, but I think that if I could do more research on patients, I think it would be interesting to see you know, how people then can renegotiate what they understand about family you know, and reproduction and to what, in, to what extent at the end it's important, this genetics in order to, to create a family. And then also another difference, which I think that it's very interesting in our cases is that this um, this difference between religious public actors, no, and how in so sometimes these topics, uh, uh, there are religious public actors that speak in the public sphere, but on the other hand, these also these also are very private topics that are not really well discussed, no, and it also affects the the, the life of the people, no, because if you don't really know what what is religiously permitted in no, in in your community then it, it it makes it even more difficult no if you happen to be infertile for example no so so it also creates this tension and i don't know if gabriela wants to add something yes I, I wanted to add only one thing that it is also part at least of my my idea when 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 accepting to be part of these uh, seminaries to discuss also this conceptualization of the global south as a unique you know, a space and context in the world that even if we see these two different cases, the same phenomenon is completely different. So when we when we address the global south, we should be careful about these differences, uh, context, nationalities, cult 
culture and so on and values regarding all the different contexts. I think that this exercise that we did with Rosa in cross-cultural comparison, even though we, we have different empirical material, uh, it's a good way of addressing just to say, okay, well, we are focusing on southern countries, non-European or non-global north countries, but we are, we are looking at it in a cross-cultural comparison and making a dialogue between both our field works to see how can we can uh, you know address this issue of, uh, of providing data uh, from uh, these territories these geographical territories uh, and also to to acknowledge uh, that this uh, relation between genetics health and family uh, it's been addressed by uh, by our research Team also in Argentina, we we have a, a project is called Genetics and Human Rights with uh, Soledad Catojo, a researcher in in Conicet, also in Argentina, and we are we are studying exactly how the the, the history of genetics and human rights in Argentina and how it affects health, uh, justice, and uh, another another an identity mainly uh, in in our in our country. So well, that's just I wanted to acknowledge that also. Yeah, so I think it's, thank you, Gabi. And I think, Rafa, you can you can start with the questions because we are, yeah, this is more or less what I want, we yeah. wanted. <laughs> Perfect, thank, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, thank you, thank you for um, the fascinating exercise of um, comparing and at the same time um, exploring each context uh, in, the, in its own way. I think that what, um, Gabriela, Gabriela mentioned um, um, now is, is key, right? Recognizing this diversity in the global south, here it becomes quite clear that uh, it's important to uh, unpack uh, this sort of um, concepts that normally are this sort of, uh, black box uh, in a Latourian term, right? And we can see like different ways on, on how uh, fertility, uh, gender, culture unfolds in connection to this biomedical technologies. And on this note, uh, since um, we've been talking about, um, and I think that Rosa and Gabriela mentioned in different ways, um, about the, the, the difficulties of dealing with this issue in, in the private lives and, and the notion of families and etc. I'd like to know from you, and I'm going to start now, I'm just jumping in and start with the first sort of question to explore a bit uh, the gender dynamics uh, within in each context. I, I know that we all, you focus more on um, uh, medical staff, Rosa, and Gabriela also has the perspective of patients, and uh, maybe you can uh, give more um, information about how, let's say, concepts of masculinity and femininity in connection to, um, to fertility and to the negotiations that happen uh, throughout this process, how how these dynamics unfold and how we, they deal with um, even the imaginaries. I think that uh, in, in a moment, um, Gabriela mentioned the imaginary of surrogacy, um, epigenetics, um, how, let's say, this is crossed by, by gender dynamics. Okay. And I mean, you either Rosa or Gabriela can start. Okay, I can start. Um... Yeah, I can start by saying thank you, Rafa, for the question. Uh, yeah, as I said, I only interview health professionals, so of course, like the gender dynamics are much more interesting, no, to analyze when when you talk about to you talk to patients, no, and and you kind of analyze them through their positionality. But it's true that that uh, when I talk to health professionals about this issue and about also because something that really. Uh, comes to our mind when we talk about infertility is, is, is women, no? And sometimes, and historically, we there has been this, although it's a terrible topic, it has always been related to women being infertile, no? And this is something that we discussed in the interviews, like how fertility is related to to, to women, so then it adds up to this burden and to this issue of not 
talking publicly about the fertility treatments, not to the family, because then they would take for granted that it's the woman and it's the fault of the woman. So, so, so the, and, and they acknowledge that this is something that happens and that it's in the imaginary of the society. But then they were, it was, what was interesting is that they were saying to me that although they did, did not give me numbers, I didn't ask about them, about, although it, it had been interesting. Some of them mentioned that when, when it comes to fertility, treatments it's sometimes it's most of the times it's half half no so it's half so so half of the cases are are because of women and half of the cases it's because of men so so that was so it's it really contrasts with this imaginary of fertility related to women no so so and i think that it stresses this importance of us so having this data and 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 talk about that, no, in order to break with these imaginaries, and also something related to women was something also, as I said, no, I I, I did it in a very exploratory way, but it was interesting because I also I end up interviewing also as uh, someone from an association of of single women in Morocco, and and that was also very interesting because it was like single women that had. Um, being pregnant out of the marriage so they were like maybe expelled from the families or that they, they escaped so it was like another circumstance not because of fertility treatments but it was interesting what was interesting is that I asked her about this possibility of women in Morocco being single and again no it would be more interesting to talk about that uh, to address that talking to women and people no but it was what, what was interesting that she talked to me well I think that this is something very difficult and it's out of the imaginary of of many women no uh, uh, that they think that they conceive this possibility of having reproductive technologies not because of being unfertile but just because they they are a single mom no so I think that this is another challenge that and let's and I think it's would be interesting to see how it develops, no? But uh, but but yeah, like how this um, this imaginary of being a single woman it's more challenging. Oh, I I just wanted to add to what Rosa said that well these women these women were the, the quotes I chose were, were women that were really Catholic, so in, in that framework uh, the imperative of you know, maternity was very strong, so they became, they were like recurrent uh, patients. I mean, they had many treatments, two or more than than in order to get uh, you know success in the treatment. So in this way, so in that context, uh, well, the cases were very similar. As Rosa said, half of them were like with men infertility problems, and the other was with women. But the the, the thing is that sometimes. Uh, they they even included in their in their narratives the role of the couple saying yeah let's say many many of them had a, a man uh, as a couple um, and it is important that this relation I haven't studied it about men and mas masculinity and IVF but I think that the when they refer to them as a couple as a partner in in this treatment sometimes they are the ones that say well it's it's time to stop for instance. So when they see that they're, they're, the women are going through many, many treatments and they are not getting success and all of these changes and on the body and so on, because it's very hard for women who, who undergo all those treatments, sometimes they appeared as the ones that say, well, we, we have to stop because even though we are not getting any any success uh, and we can do another thing. But in, in this scenario, at least the ones that we, we interviewed, uh, some of them were women that were single moms for for choice, and the other ones were couples that trying to 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 get pregnant, and it was a very you know uh, hard time on the woman, but also psychologically speaking, maybe to to the men who were partners in this in this situation. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have um, two questions on our chat. Um, first one by Xavier Jimeno. Um, have you thought about a dimension such as the presence or absence of welfare state as an explanatory factor in your research? Uh, let's start with that first and then we jump to the uh, next question. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, I can start. Yeah, we, I'm very brief. But yeah, thank you, Xavier, for, for the question. Yeah, I think that this is very interesting. As I said in my project, it was very... Uh, pilot and exploratory research. So I didn't 
I didn't go on up to the detail of that, but of course, this is something that it's relevant and that if I have the opportunity to continue with this research, it will be very relevant to focus on, because especially for economic reasons, no? because as I said uh, in the in the research, I was really worried about how religion comes no? and affects reproductive technologies, but I think that the economic uh, issue is also very relevant. No? So the role of the state in this and the, and to what extent is, is, is um, can be also covered by the state or you not know, the situation also of the health care system and the welfare state is very relevant because then it also uh, impacts to what extent women or couples can go to the clinic so so yeah yes in the case of argentina it is a it is a crucial moment the time when when the state uh decided to cover the the, the 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 treatments and you don't have to, you you don't need to have an infertility um diagnosis in order to get to get access to these to these um to these techniques but it helps if you if you have a, an infertility treatment it's more like like a you know something bureaucratic that you get the treatments and uh, so on but if you are if you don't have an infertility diagnosis you can also access to these techniques and get get them get them covered um yes and it, it it has been very crucial because more people it's not very massive though eh? but but many of many people could access to these uh techniques uh because of that legislation perfect thank you we also got um Ana Sofia Orozco um asking only the religion of the population influences the use of infertility treatment also, did the religion of the health professionals who care for patients, uh, which is also one of the questions that I had in mind. Thank you, Anna. Uh, could uh, the religion also influence how health professionals take care of the patients? Well, in in our case, with with our data, right? We're not making general assumptions of everyone, but with the data what we have, we had. Catholic women who actually um, their religion said that these techniques are, are not allowed, these technologies, sorry. And they, even though, and, and yes, they, they went to the doctor and asked for this, uh, tech, to the use of these technologies. They also went to the church and to some healers and Catholic priests in order to pray to have their, their pregnancies. But anyway, even though there is a dogmatic prohibition of the technologies they they were going to do it because they wanted to have a, a kid or a child and then uh, yes this is the, the second question is the, the one that I, I studied mainly since my PhD dissertation and yes uh, indeed I think that um, the religion in I mean sometimes it's very an influence the uh, the way the healthcare professionals, behave or if, if they are religious or not in the case of the fertility treatments well uh, i think that the cases on how, uh, what to do with the human embryos is one of the most important things because there are ontological views on the embryos such as they are considered in, for instance in argentina many people consider them uh, persons who have the same rights as a as, as a as a human person and as a born human person. So, um, yeah, I think they have an influence. Yeah, in my case, I would say the same. Like um, uh, in Morocco, uh, I didn't explore that in a, in a wide extent, but it's true that in Morocco, like uh, all the health professions that I spoke, they they define themselves as Muslims, and and when I read the question, I I thought about so so of course when I when all for them it was like an an easy uh, situation because they know that the regulation they like what they do is what it's religiously permitted, so they don't have conflict no in their work. But it's true that when I read the question, uh, I it came to my mind this an interview that I conducted to an embryologist that I asked her. Uh, what would it happen if you go to Europe, no, and to work as an embryologist as in Europe, for, and 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 you are uh, and you are required to do a 
uh, no, uh, IVF with donated material, and she recognizes that she would not like to do that. No, so 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 here we can see how religion for her influenced her work. No, of course, if we need more data on that, and of course, I think that it also depends on the people and how people no negotiate with this. But yeah, of course, as as we as it has happens in as it ha it happens in other cases such as abortion we know that people that health professions are also influenced by their religion so so i i think that in this case is very relevant and that's why i also wanted to analyze this case in spain and in barcelona and no because uh, I also want to see this um, when these tensions happen, when there is religious, more religious diversity, or Islam is a minority, you know. So, so, and I think that it, this is why it's a contrasting element. Why, when, and it's different when we are analyzing that in a Muslim country uh, rather than in a in a country in which Islam is a is a minority. Thank you. Um, let's see if you have any more questions. Also, feel free to uh, um, intervene um, through the microphones if you may. Um, any questions? I have one, I'm going to hold a little bit. Okay, so um, I'll take my uh, power to pose another question, just uh, to explore a bit more one of the issues that you raised um, as the emerging themes. I noticed that uh, you marked specifically two themes and one uh, is related to genetics. And uh, for me, uh, since we've been working in the field of science and religion for quite some time, um, and I know that you also work in this area. Um, how these concerns of uh, with epigenetics, with ge genetics, uh, emerged um, in in your field? Can you give a bit more um, a bit more details on that? I remember um, Gabriella mentioning yeah, specifically certain concerns with diseases and um, other issues related to epigenetics and genetics. Um, how this was addressed um, in your context? Well, regarding the, the, the narratives of the people we interviewed, mainly women, uh, what they say is when they look for donated material, uh, it's they <laughs> they usually refer to the donors' uh, catalog. Uh, it's not it's not an actual catalog, but the way they do it is that they say they the the practitioner, I mean, the clinician, the doctor would choose someone, someone's materials that is very similar or that looks like the couple who who, who is going to the to to access to that material. So, so if you are blonde, they are going to choose a blonde kid. If you are a brunette, they are going to choose uh, someone. Uh, no, not like it's the, the the genetic material from a person who is. Uh, similar or that looks like you. So this is something very, very important because it's 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 the way they address one of these one of these issues. I don't know. It's uh, something that we haven't done. I know a profound research on that, but the imaginaries are that is the baby going to look like me if uh, if I if I have donated material. Well, so what they do with this situation? I mean, the practitioners at the clinics is that they say that they look at the you know, at the at the donors, <laughs> um, let's say I don't know how to say it in in English, but the physiognomy or you know how how they look like, and they try to find someone very similar to you. Uh, in that area, there is a lot of work on on emotional work on this on the influence of the epigenetics of that because as they are receiving, for instance, if a person is receiving an embryo of totally donated genetic materials, sperms and eggs, then the 
that pregnant person is carrying so someone else's material and, and they have an emotional uh, work on saying that the epigenetics is an influence. So they put music, they do yoga or exercise and so on to, the, to, to, to make the environment where that embryo develops a good, a good influence for its development. So yes, these are all things that go under these imaginaries and social representations, but are present when, when they are defining how to access this treatment. Yeah, in my case, uh, the debates are totally different from what Gabriela is saying because, as I said at the beginning, um, in uh, they are it's not allowed to use donated material, no. So, so when they talk about uh, this genetics and the importance of genetics, more about the importance of the family that the family members are the family members, no, and the and that. And also to link this, uh, to and they link the use of donated materials to adultery, you no? Know? So because if you are uh, having a kid from donated material, you're really having the kids of, of someone else, no? That's what you think. That's what they think, no? So so here is the importance of of genetics. Uh, we see it in that, no? In the in in, in, in stating the importance of 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 having fertility treatments only with the material of the couple no uh, and and that's why then the adoption came also as an interesting element that it was linked because um, sometimes the same uh discourses were were used no that we cannot adopt someone um, as an alternative to be infertile because then you would do the same you would you would say that this is your kid when they, they it's not really a, your it's not your real kid no so so of course no as i said like this this is the mo like the main issue no that marks um the importance of of the treatments no and as we know of course there are a lot of ivf treatments that no do not involve donated material but when you are infertile it's more common that you end up using donated material so of course it's something that that um that makes a difference no a big difference with the potentiality of using reproductive technologies and that's why then if i think it would be very, very relevant to discuss that with patients no and to what extent at the end uh, for them, it's so relevant. And I, I remember the quote that Gabriela was saying, no, my first wish of that patient that said that my first wish is that, no, they, 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 my kid is, has a mom and dad, but then my second wish is that, no. So uh, I, I think it would be very interesting to see how this happens with Muslim couples, no, if, even though the genetics is very relevant where they ne negotiate with that, no, or to what extent this is negotiated then in real, in real, in real terms, no, or not, let's see. Definitely, that'll be a very interesting um, um, field to explore. Um, I don't know if, is there anyone else um, like to post a question otherwise i would just um thank everyone who joined us and also thank rosa martinez cuadros y gabriela Fartaval. i think that the, uh, for our first chapter uh, this was such a great conversation and I'm, I'm really happy to have you here um it's also important to remember that um the international network on science and religion and health uh aims to explore precisely this intersection between um, medical stuff, uh, perspectives, uh, biomedical technologies, a global south, global north uh, conversations, um, practitioners' perspectives also. Uh, so we, our aim here is to explore in a very um, wide range this intersection between science, religion, and health. Uh, and if there's anyone interested in engaging this field, just let us know. Um, again, thank you, everyone, and see you on our next chapter. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.